Namaste. Hi, I'm Bruce Benefield, and welcome to One World. Welcome to this edition of One World. This week's guests are Christine Ijima Hall, who's the Assistant Vice Provost at ASU West, and Mohammed Yassin Kosti, who's the President of the Association of Afghans in Arizona. And with no further ado, I'd like to welcome them both. Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Yassin, glad to have you. Now, Christine, you're involved with a lot of uh, multicultural events and, and things mm -hmm. like that through uh, being in your office at ASU West. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to get involved with that scale of, of event and, and that type of uh, uh, a scheme of things in your own life? I think that being an ethnic woman, uh, I have seen a lot of things and a lot of multiculturalism in my life, and it was amazing to me that people did not see things from the same perspective that I had, that uh -huh. people are a lot of times living in a mono-type world and, and don't diverge or, or seek other opinions, other cultures, and other issues. And so like you got to get a pry bar or something. Exactly. To get a move. Exactly. Yeah. And I think one of the major issues of education is to make sure that people do see things from different perspectives. As faculty members, we're told to present different perspectives. And so therefore, we're trying to get the students to understand and look at the world in, in a, a multicultural perspective. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. feel about it from the inside? What, mm -hmm. what prompted you in, in those respects? Well, I'm, I'm mixed. I'm half black and half Japanese. And mm -hmm. so I've always looked at the world differently than I think a lot of other people have. That that um, living in two or three or four different worlds and being again a black Japanese female uh, has has been a very important part of my life and growing up in Hispanic neighborhoods most of my life so I've always felt very multicultural and, and very gifted but I think mm -hmm. throughout my childhood people kept telling me that I was deficient or there was something wrong with me and I kept saying saying I uh, this doesn't make sense I see myself as being very gifted uh, with so many different cultures uh, people were trying to put you in little boxes saying well are you black are you Japanese are you this or you're that and going, no, I'm all of these things, and they're saying like you couldn't it be. be. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it would be a tremendous yeah. opportunity yeah. Yeah. to experience each one of the cultures that you're mm -hmm. involved with. Right. And from there, yeah. you know, it, w it would seem to me to open a lot more doors, right. um, and that other people would be able to come to you and maybe feel more open in that respect. Well, in fact, you hit the nail on the head in terms of their finding out with multiracial children that they mm -hmm. actually play the negotiator and the uh, facilitator uh, within different groups because we can see different perspectives and then one group will trust us because we're part of that group and another group will trust us because we're the part of that group also. All right. It's a very interesting role that we've taken so, on lately. No doubt, yeah. no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yasin, how, how did you get involved with the, the association? Uh, I enjoy my dual citizenship. I'm an Afghan by birth, and I'm a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. And being able to speak the language and knowing the culture of both nations, hopefully. I'm not an expert, but I do know a fair amount of it. Sure. Uh, and seeing the refugees coming out of Afghanistan to the United States and having some problems in terms of adjusting to the society, finding jobs, going and doing things around, and in short, enjoying their lives was short of anything and I thought that if I could uh, put some of my time into that perhaps I could make some change. Admirable. <laughs> I mean, it, you know it always helps to when you've gone through something yourself to be able to put your hand back and say hey come on you know, that's see, what we're see if we can do this together. Yeah. You're right that's what we're hoping to see that if we could put most of the Afghans who are on the receiving end of the welfare see if they could become on the giving end of it. Good. Um, I think that's something we could all take in. <laughs> Christine, how did you get to be where you're at, at as being the, the assistant provost? Okay. I mean, yeah. 
that had to have been a, a tremendous process in and of itself. Yeah, it was and it wasn't. It was one of those things I was actually a, a quite happy child and, and I knew that I would be going to school and I didn't think of anything else but going to school. Mm -hmm. So uh, going as far as I could, I got a PhD in psychology and, and loved it. But I found out that I had an ability to do administration, and I love to teach and do administration and do practice, but I really enjoy doing administration. And I just kept moving up uh, in the world of, of university administration, and I saw, I was telling Asim earlier that I saw an uh, uh, ad in the Chronicle of Higher Education that said, uh, come to Phoenix, open a brand new campus, and the possibility and of ever opening a brand new campus doesn't come along very often, so I jumped, right. on, that fa I jumped on that opportunity. Well, congratulations. Mm -hmm. now, what kinds of fears did you have to deal with in going through that? Um, I think it was a, a, a not only just being a woman and being a minority. Someone told me it's because I'm short that people also don't <laughs> <laughs> don't look at you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, people don't think that you're that powerful or that strong when you're sitting, uh -huh. you know, d uh, quite short. I'm five foot, and uh, someone. Uh, so my motto in life is to speak softly but carry a big mouth. Is what I'd say. Well, good things come in small it's, baggages. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so actually, that was the hardest part. And being a woman, uh, being a minority, and being short, and being young. I used to be young. <laughs> <laughs> was a major still looking. yeah thank you still was a, a major issue in administration especially in education it's uh, still a very old boy network mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to break those uh, those stereotypes uh, of of someone else moving in I think the important part is that women and and ethnic minorities and other people bring in a diversity that education had not had been preaching to the students as I said earlier but was not looking at through the administration some changes that need to be made in education. Do you find that, mm -hmm. that in a lot of places mm -hmm. where there is an administrative level mm -hmm. that their message mm -hmm. is heard by the people but they don't listen to them themselves? You got it, exactly. And I think that occurs in a lot of administration and I think that's why you see a lot of disgruntled workers in, in any workforce is that they're saying, well you're telling us we have to do it but you haven't done it yourself. Right. Yeah. Stop talking, do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, so what, what kind of fears did you run into? now? in your process especially of coming to the United States and becoming involved with the culture here what did you have to go through? Uh, when I came the first time it was in 1963 I was a student then and of course at that time you don't have a lot of fear because I would go to the university but the second time after the takeover of the Russians when I came the fear was would I be able to find a job? Would I be able to cope with the pressure of job? would I be successful enough in the job? Mm -hmm. And majority of what I had fear was the unknown. And as fearful as I was, I kept trying. I show, put, put a face as if I'm brave enough to go. And of course, whether I was trembling or not. Acted uh, as I, if and made it so. <laughs> right, and, yeah. it, and it did work. Uh, I had failures, I had success. And uh, most of the time I consider the success part of it as part of my life and forget about the failure mm -hmm. part of it and keep on going. Sure, the failure, the, the stepping stones to the success. Right, and that's what I like to do with the society that we have to see that if we can get them to realize that not everything is success, but even the failures are part of success. Exactly, you, there's a, a, a bit of truth or a, a glean of wisdom within each failure that gives you the ability to say, okay, I see what I, what I did or didn't do and I need to adjust that and change it in the next encounter and generally that provides even more ground to to learn from and grow from and work through even more of the fears. You're right. Was there anything that you found in particular in coming to the American culture, culture that was offensive? Uh, I don't think uh anything so offensive in the first place. I don't take anything so personal. Okay. I think that every person is born to do certain things their own way. But I do know there were times that I didn't like certain things. I, and still there are things that I may not like, but uh, if I get really upset, I try to manage it. Yeah. So th in other words, yes, there were a few things that were bothering me, like uh, I had never had any alcohol. And when I saw people here drinking alcohol and then getting somewhat uh, out of control, uh, that was to me kind of a little wonder, didn't it? It was making it harder on me yeah. to believe as to why do you have to buy the headache? 
if you want to enjoy it, there are other ways that you could enjoy. So that was one of the things. Sure. Christine, in, in doing uh, your job at, at ASU, um, how do you see what you've gone through reflecting in the, the people that, are surround, that you're surrounded by? Or say the people that you're surrounded with. Mm -hmm. In terms of what I've gone through? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you see that reflecting mm -hmm. in the common human experience that is within your circle of friends or mm -hmm. uh, associates within the university? Um, I like to surround myself and I see myself and my friends and social backgrounds, uh, people who are very open minded and who are diverse in their thoughts. Um, it, it's funny because I want to say that I'm open and I'm diverse, but then I get angry with people with closed minds, and that's not diverse in some respects. But uh, I like to see a lot of differences. Um, mm -hmm. If you ever come to one of my parties, you're welcome to come anytime you like. Love to. Okay. Let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you'll see. You'll see such. Oh, a, <laughs> I won't tell you where I live. Okay. No. Um, but uh, there's such a diversity of people there in terms of age and and gender and color and sexual orientations and and professions and abilities and whatever I. I love that, uh, you know, I love that part of me, and I think coming from a, a, a mixed race family to begin with, that we were told not to look at colors, we were told to look at the inside of people, and it's very interesting, because the friends I have at school, and work, and wherever, get along with my friends other places, and a lot of times you see those people not getting along, that you are different in different uh, parts of your life, and it's a compliment I felt, someone said to me once, that they said, every time you have a party, I get along with everyone, so that means I'm the same in all my lives, which made me feel good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find too for myself that mm -hmm. I seek out the differences, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the outer world because I know that behind that outer shell mm -hmm. there's a whole another experience that I haven't had the blessing of having a part of yet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I seek that out, you know. Mm -hmm. What can I learn? How can we share? Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know about you. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Hi, how are you? What can mm -hmm. we do together to you know, to be creative. And the fascinating thing about it is that words are similar, uh, foods are similar, uh, music is similar, uh, a lot of different things. And you find out, you go, my gosh, my culture does that. And someone says, well, my culture does that. And it's sure. marvelous to see Yeah, there's that. bits and pieces yeah. throughout them all yeah. that are similar yeah. in experience. They may yeah. have a, a, a yeah. different expression. Exactly. Um, but the, the similarity is there. Yeah. Yasin, how about you? That, how do you see that what you're doing now? Uh, I know when we met the other day, uh, you were having a meeting of the association where there were some engineers and a, uh, a PhD and uh, a business owner that were coming together to uh, help integrate the Afghanis and, and the, uh, for the Afghans. I'm not sure which <laughs> sometimes. The Afghans is okay. a way of saying it. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I get most of my lessons from three people in my life. That's my wife and my two kids. Uh, and with the combination of the three that we look at, uh, sometimes I find out as if I am in a multicultural society in one mm -hmm. roof. And when we put all of that, uh, I also remember one of the advices that my mother had always given me. I, when I was a kid, I used to shout and scream. And she asked me that, how many years do you have and how many tongues do you have? <laughs> if God would have wanted you to talk twice, would have given you two tongues. Uh, when I sit with these groups of people, I try to listen. Uh, not that I'm perfect, but I do listen to the facts, and I think you observed part of what uh, I was doing in that sure. meeting. And then see if I could use their own wording to improve the situation of what we have and find a solution, uh, if at all there is any solution. And so at least change the method of what they are unhappy with to something that they could look somewhat happier and put a smile on their face. Right, and especially when you listen well enough to hear how they're speaking, not necessarily what is necessary also. The key is the language that, the, that is being used and how you can communicate back with them so that they can know that, yeah, you're hearing them. That's correct. And, right. and saying, okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I understand, and let's try this way. Or how do you see things evolving from your perspective? What do you need, and how can I help you find that? Correct. Because most solutions actually come out of their own questions, mm -hmm. if one would really look at it. Yeah, when you find the right question, the solution's within it, generally. Exactly. 
It's just finding that question. Yeah. This is all around hard sometimes. <laughs> well, but you know, and that's the importance of diversity too. And people don't understand that when you have diversity in a room, like you mm -hmm. said, with three people, the other three people, is that you hear things that you did, wouldn't have heard, you think things that you wouldn't have heard, and you have questions that you wouldn't have thought of. Right. And if you have more diversity in a room, you're much more creative. Oh, you bet. You bet. Mm -hmm. And sitting here, the mm -hmm. three of us, this mm -hmm. is the first time that we've all three sat down mm -hmm. and talked and look at what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's by design. Yeah. However, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're getting along and we're seeing similarities in, in how we're addressing things. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of barriers do you see uh, to a larger uh, multicultural community, um, locally and globally? Mm. It's, it's, I think it's fear of losing yourself or losing power that scares me when people do not want to look at things globally. And I, for me, most of the discrimination and the isms in the, in the world, or in the United States specifically, that I know about is fear of, of, of economic issues, fear of power issues, fear of uh, someone marrying your daughter that shouldn't be marrying, you think shouldn't marry your daughter. I think fear, um, a lot of ignorance, uh, and economics is, is a major issue, and it, it saddens me because I still believe there's enough out there for everybody. There's enough power, there's enough money, there's enough uh, uh, giving of a lot of issues that people should not have to be afraid of this. And what we're, right. what we're trying to tell people, I think, when we're dealing with the diversity issues is, again, that there's power in the diversity and that if you open up to that, you'll get more back. And I, I love in the Native American language, there's supposedly no word for spend, because anything you spend or give out will come back to you in, in, in multifold. And I, I feel that way about life. So I Energy wish people- spend is never Exactly, renamed. exactly. Yeah. You know, so if people would stop doing this, that maybe that we could have something open up a little bit more. You mentioned the, yeah. the constantly the diversity. Yeah. I mean, how can we see the unity mm -hmm. in that diversity yes, yes. because it's there that's what makes creation such a yeah. wonderful place to be exactly. you know well the saying that we use in my office for our motto is that uh, there's very little difference between one person and another but what little difference there is is very important exactly it's beautiful so everybody is basically the same but there's a little difference and it's the value you put on that difference that makes and the honor and, and, the honor. and respect mm -hmm. for it I think that's what kind of gets in the ways where exactly. people don't respect each other's boundaries and they zoom right in yeah. and they don't ask for one thing. Mm -hmm. They just normally assume that they can go right in mm -hmm. or they've been used to it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people are somewhat uh, more open. They don't put up things soon enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't emote. Mm -hmm. They don't talk. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we're living in a society of uh, mind readers and, you know, I don't think we're all that psychic yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and how do you see things, uh, of course, the, the barriers the coming up? university point of view, she looks at it from a global point, uh, whereas uh, I am looking from a very smaller portion of it with the smallest society that we have in Arizona from Afghanistan. Uh, I am dealing with a group of people who have been tortured, who have been going through sufferings that actually we may not be even able to imagine uh, and they have lived in a society where education had been very little uh, health wasn't that big and great and so now they have come to a different society and uh, I think that like what Christine was mentioning education becomes the biggest part of what we have to do to mm -hmm. get these people to become productive they cannot forget what has happened to them but to help them understand that now this, that's over with Right. And they are in a different society that cares for them, likes to help them become very active members and uh, productive members. And so with that, uh, we are trying to get various organizations if they could help us economically so we could put some teachers to teach these people in their own language, in their own culture. Uh, just to give you one of the examples, a few weeks sure. ago, Ismail, whom you know, right. the vice president of our association, gave a talk, and he was making a comparison of as to why the Afghans are afraid of the police officers. They <laughs> were no afraid wonder. of any uniform sure. officer. To them, any uniform officer, at least in the last 15 years, had been threatening their lives. But that we can work out. And so Major some trust, is trust issue there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so we have a long way in front of us, but that's what we are hoping to 
look into, and that's the problem that I see at the moment, to educate these people that, that they can trust each other while there are some times that you have to be careful. Right. And from our culture, I mean, most of the people here in this country that have grown up here haven't had to deal with something like that. So it is totally out of even their own imagination sometimes to get in touch with the kind of environment that people come from. That's correct. Um, you know, a lot of it totally beyond their control. And then to, to bring them in and nurture and, and help bridge those trust gaps, mm -hmm. not only within themselves, but in the, the community as a whole. That's a tremendous process to initiate. It is a tremendous process, and there are some projects that are being uh, able to help us, and I'm sure that through some programs at the University of Christian may help me also sure. learn some more about that mm -hmm. as to how we could get these folks back on the track of being normal and productive people. How do you see it being overcome? How do you see the barriers melting mm -hmm. away? Well, I think it's something that Yassim just said was education. Um, and one of the things that I try to do at ASU West is to make sure that we have a, a, a variety of presentations about different cultures, different lifestyles, because people don't understand why people react certain way or why people do certain things right. when they don't understand the culture from which they come. Yeah. And so once you teach them and show other people what it was like, then you understand why people are afraid of police officers, why people uh, are afraid of sirens, why people react to certain things, That's and then people are a lot more tolerant of those behaviors when they know when they're, where they came from. Right. One yeah. of my uh, mm -hmm. nephews came to the United States about five, six years back, and we were sitting in the house, and my daughter came and pulled the curtain a little faster. Mm -hmm. And this kid jumped off mm -hmm. and sat in a corner. Three months, he wasn't talking. And we couldn't understand why. After three months of really being patient with him and trying to see, I asked him, what happened? He said, I thought a machine gun fired. This kid had walked for eight days under that kind of a machine gun fire until he got to safety in Pakistan and we could get him to the United States. Fortunately, he's okay now. <laughs> you mentioned something that, that spurred, and I'm trying to pull it back out <laughs> again, darn it. <laughs> in the overcoming uh, and the, the blending of, of the cultures, do you see that the arts and crafts, or do you see it more from a psycho-spiritual and scientific technology standpoint of what's really uh, the necessity there, or, or do you see that blending all together? I see it as all of the above. Uh, I think that I think everybody sees the world from a different perspective, and, and there's parts of you that are psychic oriented, and parts of you who are arts oriented, parts of you who are right brain, left brain, uh, you know. And there's so many different ways to approach it, and I think we need to approach it in all those different ways. And I know that uh, I might be Good. more, yeah. <laughs> uh, and in different parts of my life, at work, I'm a lot more, you know. Uh, uh, intellectually based or whatever and but at, at work also it's kind of like um my favorite show is Star Trek, the original. Hey, and the <laughs> thing, thing, thing. But uh, Spock said that the reason he could not be a captain was that he didn't have the guts or the the the, the heart to, to make those type of decisions. And sometimes you have to make a decision from your gut and not just from logic. Right. And so sometimes we have to think about different things through a logical point of view, through a gut point of view, through a spiritual point of view, through an intellectual point of view. And we have to hear it from all those different sides and they converge at some point and then finally meld together. Yeah, and yeah. I think we'll, that we've yeah. missed that for a while because mm -hmm. decisions have been based on the bottom line, mm -hmm. exactly. which don't take mm -hmm. anybody into consideration mm -hmm. other than the dollar. Right. And that's what, as I see it, one of the things that we need to be aware of, first mm -hmm. of all, nurture it away from that, you know, not necessarily point fingers at it and condemn it or anything like that because when you do that, you get three coming right back at you. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. However, to find solutions that in order to to bring that about peacefully and with constructive means. That's great, I think. Um, <laughs> not to trail off there in the middle of a sentence. Uh, yes, and how, how do you see things uh, coming together from your standpoint with the involvement that you have in your particular group? Uh, the group that we have in Arizona, uh, in, in a very funny way, if you may put it that way, is split into two different areas. The Tucson mm -hmm. area mostly are people who are dealing with the university and they have masters, PhDs, and or at least working for some of the degrees. And with the group that you have in the Phoenix, 
it's half and half. The first half is well educated, the other half are people who have had high school or lesser uh, degrees and or totally illiterate and elderly folks. Uh, with the people who are very well educated, like Christine was saying, all of the above may work. But when you look at the group of people who have not received much of education, uh, again, I'd like to qualify that I'm not an expert, but I'd like to say that spiritual ways makes a lot of big difference compared to any other way. Because if they could see that, that they believe in whatever they do, and then they go on into uh, doing some other things, with that power, they get it done. Right. That's how I feel. Spot on to me. Well, it's interesting because, you know, the, the, the spiritual and the gut and the psychic part, I think they try to push that down a lot in education, and that bothers me. I'm a, a psychologist also. Right. And one of the things that they don't really teach you to do is use your gut and use that spiritual side of you when you're, when you're talking to people. You go by the book and, you know, you go down the line and do a diagnosis. A lot of times it comes from within. So in yeah. relation to that, mm -hmm. what best advice can you give to our viewers mm -hmm. to be able to, to integrate that? To listen, to listen to what's going on inside. And what I used to do with people that I was helping to train, I said, I said, what do you think the problem is? And they would go through it on a piece of paper. I said, no, what does it tell you inside here? And it was something totally different. So just listen. That's all you have to do is just listen. Similar to, to what he said earlier, it's just to listen. I used to, to tell people. my daughter, yeah. you know, listen to your belly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tell you what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Justin, how about you? What, what's the, the best advice that you can give on a daily basis for our viewers? I, I would think that uh, just look ahead, be positive and do whatever comes to your head as the best possible way of doing it. That's the best way I look at it. Perfect. We're out of time. Thank you both. I've really enjoyed it, and I'm sure that the, the audience has. And Thank you, uh, Chris. Much success to you both. Appreciate Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank you all for watching. I would open the show with Namaste. It comes from the Brahmi language, which is actually one of the oldest languages of our planet Earth. And it simply means, I worship that which is within you. Think of what we could do walking down the street, thinking about that with everyone we meet. What kind of changes would that precipitate? Think about it. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you'd like to find out more about the show, please give us a call or just give us a call anyway. Let us know what you think about it. and. Uh, Let's carry on. Our phone number is 602-264-0986. So pick up the phone and dial it. Or if you haven't got the energy or would like to postpone that, drop us a line. Care of One World, P.O. Box 32035, Phoenix, Arizona, 85064. Again, I'm Bruce Benefield, also known as Zendor. Namaste. Namaste.